On the night after my father's unveiling, my extended family, aunts and uncles, cousins and all, gathered in my mom's living room to watch old family movies that my dad's youngest brother, Jerry, had brought. Like so many family records these days, the videos had journeyed from silent 8mm film to VHS to DVD. And at some point in the 1990s, while making the original set of VHS tapes, my Uncle Jerry had sat with his mother and asked her to narrate the silent movies explaining all of the people and places in these clips from the 1940s and 50s. It was all good fun for a while, until a middle-aged African-American woman came on screen holding a white toddler, and my grandmother exclaimed with palpable affection, Oh my, it's Blackie! There was a collective cringe as we all had the same thought. There's no way that woman's given name was Blackie. But that was clearly how my grandma Sarah of blessed memory knew her and remembered her some 50 years later without any self-consciousness. God forbid we should speak ill of the dead. My grandmother was a kind, loving woman, not someone I ever thought of as racist or bigoted. Her reaction to seeing the nanny on screen was unambiguously warm. But there is a context to Grandma Sarah's life that shaped the way she approached the world. Born to Ukrainian immigrant parents in Hattiesburg, Mississippi in 1917, my grandmother moved to Mobile, Alabama as a teenager. My father, her eldest son, was born there in 1940 and lived in Mobile right up until he came here to Penn in 1958. After the Army and a brief return to Mobile, my father took a job with the Coca-Cola Company in Atlanta, which is where I was born and raised. A Southern Jew's life is defined by liminal ambivalence, belonging and not belonging, privilege and exclusion. Jewish day school insulated me to a large extent, but on those occasions where I was outside of an explicitly Jewish context, day camps, Boy Scout troops, I felt very clearly how I almost belonged, but not quite. I was white, but I was not really part of the mainstream. For that, you had to be Baptist, Episcopal, Methodist. I ate different things. I celebrated different holidays. I went to church on a different day. And that was Atlanta in the 1980s and 90s. My father, who went to public school in Mobile in the 1950s, was outright barred from various school clubs. His parents knew not to bother applying for a country club membership. But when push came to shove, they were white. And that made all the difference. After the unveiling, my daughter Odelia and I took a road trip with my uncles, Jerry and Bill, back to Mobile for a tour of their and my father's childhood. It was a trip I had hoped to take with my dad before he passed away, and I'm forever grateful that my uncles took the time to make the trip with us. I think we spent almost as much time in the car on the way there and back as we did in Mobile itself. And that gave us a lot of time to hear stories about my grandparents and growing up in Alabama. Much of what they shared was new to me, mostly because I now have questions that I never thought to ask when my grandparents were alive. And I'm still struggling to make sense of who they were and how they related to their world. My Uncle Bill recalled a gathering of adults at their house on the night that George Wallace, a militant segregationist, was elected governor, how his parents and their Jewish friends worried about the implications of such an outspoken bigot in power. And yet he also acknowledged that his parents were not civil rights activists, probably believed that African Americans were essentially inferior to white people. They knew black people as domestic servants and laborers, not as neighbors. 
the store that my great-grandfather opened, that my grandfather operated, that my dad and his brothers worked in on the weekends, had a separate colored entrance. Jim Crow was their world. A few weeks before my father died, I had the opportunity to interview him about his life and experiences. At the very end of our interview, he told me the story of his own awakening to the injustice of segregation, and tonight, with Zoom's help, we can hear him tell the story in his own words. By the time of our interview, my father's cancer had weakened his voice, so you may need to adjust your volume a little bit as we listen. His story takes place in my grandfather's store in Pritchard, Alabama, a suburb of Mobile, around 1955. We were talking earlier about, about racism, and a, a story comes to mind when I say the store. Um, the store was in Pritchard, which was a suburb of Mobile, a majority black uh, inhabitants, residents, and farmers who would come in from the surrounding farms. Um, but the store had men's room and women's room and colored and white. They had water fountains colored and white. That was the way it was. And when I was a teenager, let's say 15, 16, working there one Saturday probably, um, one of the jobs I had was sorting out the hangers, the wooden hangers from the wire hangers, etc., and breaking down boxes, making them flat for what was then garbage. We didn't have recycle. Um, and that room was right off of the shoe department, and the water fountain was in the shoe department. So I could see the people shopping, and I could see the fountains. And as I looked out one afternoon, there was an older black woman and a little boy, three or four years old, and he wandered over to the water fountain and there was a step stool for kids and he climbed up to the white fountain and she turned and she saw him and the panic in her face and she rushed over and grabbed him off of that stool and started looking around to see if anybody had seen and she saw me watching and the fear in her eyes and that's when I got it, that there was something really wrong here. That this, this didn't make any sense. But up until then, it was just, that was the way it was. We were talking. That was the way it was. A grown woman terrified of a teenage boy who saw her toddler touch a water fountain. But my dad was white, and they were black. Their world gave my father, not even an adult, extraordinary power. Had he repeated the story to the wrong people, potentially even the power of life and death. And that power disparity not only in the Jim Crow South, but throughout America, going back to the arrival of the first slave ship in 1619, has warped the lives of everyone in this country, continues to warp our lives to this very day. All summer, I've been haunted by a hand-lettered sign I saw a young white woman carry during the Black Lives Matter marches. It read, privilege is when you think something isn't a problem because it isn't a problem for you. I've lived my life behind layers of privilege. I go to sleep every night 
secure in the knowledge that armed police will not kick in my door in a no-knock raid and then riddle my home with bullets, as they did to Breonna Taylor. I've been pulled over now and again, but aside from a few fines and some grief from Rebecca about my bad driving, it's no big deal. Unlike Philando Castile, shot seven times at close range during a traffic stop. As my children get older, I don't have the same worries about their safety that parents of black children bear. For my children, police mean help and safety. I've known this for a long time, but there was something about that sign. Privilege is when you think something isn't a problem because it isn't a problem for you that drove home what it meant for me to live with levels of privilege that so many others are denied. Even as I strive to examine my privilege, I'm still caught off guard by the extent to which that privilege blinds me. At the beginning of the summer, I was invited to join a virtual panel hosted by my former congregation in Chicago that would bring together all of the former associate rabbis in conversation with the senior rabbi we served with to explore what this time of COVID would mean for the future of synagogues. I was honored to be invited, excited to be back with my former community, albeit virtually, and eager to be in conversation with other colleagues about the new world emerging around us. Then I got the promotional flyer and saw my face smiling back at me in the midst of a lineup of six white men. Under the heading, The Future of the American Synagogue. And suddenly it sank in. Despite years of working alongside women in the rabbinate, despite having gone to great lengths to ensure that I always included a woman on any panel of rabbis I organized, here I had failed to ask who else would be on the panel before accepting, had failed even to stop and think about what I knew for myself, that all the alumni rabbis of that congregation were white men. I should have seen for myself what that panel would end up looking like, but I didn't stop to reflect and notice. As the event started to be promoted, a local colleague reached out to ask for my commitment in the spirit of gender justice allyship to decline invitations to all male panels. Her email was exceptionally kind, for which I am beyond grateful but also unflinching in holding up to me a mirror in which I could see the impact of my actions on the women in my field. I had, in fact, already made that commitment to myself long ago, but I thought this time, given the circumstances, that the invitations were specifically for rabbis who had already served this particular con congregation, I thought this time I could make an exception. I was wrong. As Rabbi Jonathan Wittenberg, one of England's leading Masorti rabbis, writes, to think of oneself as morally insulated from one's community is to misunderstand the nature of responsibility. We are as responsible as our sphere of influence. This doesn't mean that we are personally guilty for every wrong that a host of other people may commit but it does mean that we are answerable for the wider impact of our behavior on society, as well as for the impact it might have had were we to have found the wisdom and the courage to conduct ourselves otherwise. What my fellow rabbi was saying to me in her email was that we work as a community of rabbis, and women are counting on men like me to exercise the wisdom and courage Wittenberg describes in order to expand equity in a field that was exclusively a male domain until recently. I was afraid to question the makeup of the panel. I was honored to have been invited. I didn't want to be the guy who spoiled the fun for everyone else, reigned on a program that the other rabbis seemed so excited to be a part of. My courage faltered 
at the very moment when I needed it most. I didn't speak out when I should have, and I'm sorry I didn't. The regret still feels very present for me, and I hope it sticks around, not as a punishment, but so I will remember next time to make different choices, ones I can feel more proud of. There's a little paragraph that slips into the private Amidah for Yom Kippur all the way at the end after the confessions. Our high holiday prayers are so different to begin with that it took me years to really notice this piece and even more time for its true meaning to set in. It's a curious little prayer, personal, phrased in the singular, I, when as a rule our prayers are plural, we, despairing when so many of our tefillot are hopeful. Situated at the very end of the Amidah, I suspect many of us skip over it entirely in an effort to catch up with the davening as the leader's repetition begins. And yet this short prayer, I believe, holds a key to understanding what this day is all about. Oh my God, even before I was created, I was unworthy and now, having been created, I am barely more than before. Afar ani b'chayai kal v'chomer b'mitati. I am dust during my lifetime that much more in death. Hare ani lefanecha kichli malei busha uchlima. Here I am before you like a vessel filled with embarrassment and shame. May it be your will, Adonai, my God and God of my ancestors, that I sin no more. And as for those sins I have committed before you, scrape them away with your great compassion, just not through suffering or terrible illness. The process of tshuva, repentance, return, demands that we break down our self-construction in order to rebuild. Within the armored towers of pride, entitlement, and yes, privilege, we remain insulated from the questions, doubts, and regrets that drive tshuva. Think about the way we describe an arrogant person. We say they are full of themselves. What a brilliant turn of phrase. Pride fills us up with our own self-constructed image, crowding out the image of God. And if we can't see the image of God within ourselves, <laughs> and so the work of the day becomes emptying ourselves out, stripping away the layers of self-regard that hold us back from making change. And to the extent we have enjoyed privilege that came at the expense of others in society, Yom Kippur demands that we account for our privilege and the costs it imposes upon others, and then use that accounting for acts of restitution. And that restitution will not come easily. In her new book, Cast, the most recent selection of BZBI's anti-racist reading group, which emerged out of the discussion series Confronting Racism as Jews, facilitated earlier this year by Rabbi Batya Glazer, Isabel Wilkerson lays out the evidence for America's racial and class struggles emerging from a deeper caste system that has always sorted and ranked the people who live within our borders, with people of African descent and indigenous peoples at the very bottom and women always beneath men within each caste. I, born white and male, straight and cisgender, into a relatively affluent family in the South, I find the book highly unsettling. And like the email I received from my fellow rabbi about my appearing on an all-male panel, I find it impossible to deny the truth in Wilkerson's portrait of our history and our present. And the most difficult truth of all is that the fact that I don't personally harbor racist attitudes means little when the system itself, our laws, 
our education and healthcare systems, our business culture, is set up to perpetuate a racially stratified caste system. I imagine the term anti-racist may be new to many of us. I only encountered it for the first time about a year ago. What exactly do we mean by describing a person or group as anti-racist? When racial bias is encoded into the system, simple neutrality doesn't go far enough. America's caste system will perpetuate itself even without my help. And it's important to note that privilege is not an on-off switch. It's possible to be privileged in some respects and disadvantaged by privilege in others. Take, for example, a white woman, privileged by race, disadvantaged by gender. Change will only come when we take an active stance to address the harmful consequences of caste privilege in America. It is not enough to not be racist or sexist, Wilkerson insists. Our times call for being pro-African American, pro-woman, pro-Latino, pro-Asian, pro-Indigenous, pro-humanity, in all its manifestations. Defeating racism requires more of us than just to abandon ideas and prejudices. It demands that we work tirelessly to dismantle the hierarchy of race itself, a hierarchy that has been in place for over 400 years, which was encoded into the founding documents of our country and which continues to shape the fates of Americans today in areas as diverse as health education, political power, business, and above all else, criminal justice. In breaking down the walls of entitlement that hinder our chuva, we must interrogate our privilege and understand how it shapes our experience of the world. As hard as I have worked to get where I am today, I also recognize that I received an immense head start my parents sent me to private Jewish day schools and a great college, supported me through five years of rabbinical school and business school. They were able to do all of that because of my father's career as a Fortune 500 executive after he attended Wharton and served as an officer in the US Army. His family could send him to Penn in large part because of the wealth my grandfather and great-grandfather built through their store and other real estate investments. And while both of them were extremely savvy businessmen, there can be no denying the fact that the essential ticket to their success in Mississippi and Alabama was the color of their skin. We all worked hard, but none of us earned our complexion. And even though my father, grandfather, and great-grandfather all faced levels of anti-Semitism that I have not personally encountered, those struggles pale in comparison to the immense advantages we received simply because of the color of our skin. Our own people has suffered unspeakable horrors throughout history. Even in this country, where we have been spared the worst ravages visited upon our ancestors, outright discrimination against Jews was widespread until very recently. And, as if we could forget, violent anti-Semitism is on the rise again right here in America. Wilkerson draws explicit links between the racial caste system that has always forced black Americans to the bottom, the surging hatred toward Muslim and Latino immigrants, and the growing anti-Semitism that led, most terribly, to the terrorist attack at Tree of Life Synagogue two years ago. Indeed, one of the most disturbing revelations in Wilkerson's books are the ways in which Nazi leaders Yamach Shamam not only knew that America had a racial caste system, but studied how our country treated its black citizens in order to best understand how they could segregate, dehumanize, and ultimately slaughter Europe's Jews. At the same time, we should not make the mistake of equating the Jewish story of oppression with the suffering endured by black people in this country. 
Wilkerson challenges us to see beyond our own experiences in order to find empathy for those who have suffered at the hands of America's caste system. She writes, when an accident of birth aligns with what is most valued in a given caste system, whether being able-bodied, male, white, or other traits in which we had no say, it gives that lottery winner a moral duty to develop empathy for those who must endure the indignities that they themselves have been spared, to listen with a humble heart, to understand another's experience from their perspective, not as we imagine we would feel. It may be that we hear stories that resonate with our own history, and I have sometimes heard from black clergy that Jewish stories of perseverance and redemption from the Bible all the way through to the Shoah and the founding of the State of Israel have offered them visions of hope and inspiration. Nevertheless, the fact remains that our experience is not the same as the black experience. It turns out that a person can be a target of discrimination and a beneficiary of privilege at the same time. Even in the days of social anti-Semitism, restricted clubs and the like, white Jews enjoyed most, if not all, of the privileges of whiteness. We remember the lynching of Leo Frank, which prompted the founding of the ADL as a seminal event in American Jewish history precisely because it was such a singular and rare event, whereas lynching of African Americans was commonplace. We must listen with humility when our black neighbors, and especially those who sit at the intersection of black and Jewish, tell their own stories in their words from their perspective. Wilkerson's portrait of America's caste system helped me find a new understanding of one of Yom Kippur's perennial enigmas. Why does our confession take the form of a fixed litany of sins, phrased in plural, many of which none of us have actually committed? Ashamnu, Hamasnu, Tsararnu, Ta'inu, Titanu, we have sinned, we have been violent, we have oppressed, we have gone astray, we have led others astray. We may not have done these things with our own hands, but we have, if through no fault of our own, inherited a system that does them all. As Rabbi Wittenberg reminds us, we are as responsible as the sphere of our influence. The fact that I personally did not own slaves or write discriminatory laws pales in comparison to the degree to which I, as a straight, cisgender, white man, directly benefit from the marginalization of people of color, women, and the LGBTQ community just by walking in the world. And none of that is earned. It simply came to me in the lottery of being born. America spilled Breonna Taylor's blood. America stole George Floyd's breath. Philadelphia is where Dominique Remy Fells, a black trans woman, lived and was murdered. Alchet shechatanu lefanecha biyodim uvlo yodim, we have sinned whether we knew it or not. We are left to face two unpalatable choices. To accept the tainted bounty of privilege and thereby become complicit in America's poisonous caste system, or to use what privilege we have to push back against the system on behalf of equality and true justice. I believe that our tradition in holding up the divine image in each human and commanding us to remember at all times our historical experiences of oppression and suffering, our tradition calls us to take the second course, to recognize our privilege and to take concrete actions in service of restitution to those who have been beaten down, disenfranchised, oppressed, mistreated, tortured, murdered in order to build and sustain the hierarchy in which we were all raised. Restitution may seem easy in theory, 
a thief needs to pay back what he stole. But when it comes to privilege, racism, the American caste system, restitution becomes not only complex but extremely painful. To choose just one personal example, when I think about how I should have responded to the panel invitation I received this summer, pointing out to the organizers that women and people of color would not be represented, asking how we might address that issue, and potentially bowing out if necessary, I would have made myself vulnerable in opening up these concerns, risked disapproval or criticism from more senior colleagues, and potentially forfeited future invitations. Despite the potential cost, I wish I had summoned the courage necessary to take that risk. And I honestly believe that my fellow rabbis would have heard what I had to say. And they would not have been able to hear that from a woman because there were no women in the conversation in the first place. The people on the bottom of our caste system bear the lion's share of the costs but lack the means to fix the problems on their own as they did not create the system. It was made by people who look like me, and I must have an active hand in dismantling it. I, a white, heterosexual, cisgender man, must stand for gender equality alongside women, insist on racial justice beside people of color, ally with the queer community to stand up for equal dignity before the law and society. And if the costs of restitution are significant on an individual scale, they become monumental when we consider what it might take to redress the historical toll. How does a society make restitution for tens of millions of black bodies stolen from Africa and trafficked as property on our shores? We know fewer than half of the names of the black men, women, and children who were lynched by which I mean publicly tortured and murdered with the tacit permission and often the active participation of law enforcement and government officials. And even the total number of people murdered in these acts of terror is an estimate and probably much lower than the true total. From slavery to sharecropping to redlining to the prison industrial complex, for four centuries, our country has accumulated wealth on the literal backs of our black and brown siblings. Even if we could wave a wand and erase the history of a caste system that is fundamentally racial, but also breaks along lines of gender, sexual orientation, and disability, it would not be enough. Because the last 400 years have given some of us such a vast head start over others that it is too late for equality of opportunity. This year, I hear Maimonides' first principle of tshuva ringing in my ears. There can be no tshuva without honest confession and full restitution. For close to 30 years, Michigan Representative John Conyers Jr. introduced a piece of legislation known as H.R. 40 during each session of Congress. Conyers' bill, which following his death last year has been championed by Texas Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, calls for a congressional study of slavery and its lingering effects, as well as recommendations for appropriate remedies. Two paths are generally suggested as appropriate remedies, truth and reconciliation commissions and formal reparations. Precisely the honest confession and full restitution Maimonides sets as prerequisites for tshuva. And yet, over three decades, no matter which party was in power, the House has never brought the bill for a vote. We have not, so far, been willing just to study the question of how we might begin the process of tshuva for our nation's history of racial terror. And so any other steps we might take, however well-intentioned, will not affect the atonement we say we desire. 
Reparations are now part of the national conversation to an extent that would have seemed unthinkable to me just five years ago. And yet all too often when the subject of reparations for slavery comes up among white people, I hear it discussed as if it's a nice theory but not a practical op option for America. But I no longer see any other practical option. We will never cleanse the stain of racist state-sponsored terror from our country without truth and reconciliation commissions, a complete reckoning of what we as a nation, if not as individuals, have done to people of color, as well as to women, as well as to LGBTQ folk throughout our history. Only restitution, yes, reparations, will wash the blood off our nation's hands. And that process will be costly and excruciatingly painful, as real chuva almost always is. I'm still learning my way through all of this, and I feel like I'm a long way from fully understanding all the dimensions of my privilege. I know I miss opportunities to stand up when I could, that I don't always listen well to experiences from the other side of the privilege gap. Still, tonight I hear Maimonides loud in my ears. There can be no chuva without honest confession and full restitution. So I commit myself here tonight in front of us all to stay in the work, to maintain a careful accounting of my privilege and how it impacts those around me, to listen with radical empathy, to open myself to feedback from my community when I misstep, and to use my privilege in service of those who have historically been left out. And I ask each one of you in your own ways to join me in this, because the work is too big for me alone. I need you. We need one another. The work begins now, tonight, within each of us. God, grant us the strength and the compassion to do your will in our world.